think it's time. Uh, let's start. Uh, good morning. Okay, maybe it's lunchtime already, uh, but I'm before lunchtime. So hello to my uh, talk. My name is Guido Schmutz. Um, I'm from Switzerland. I'm working for Trivadis at Switzerland. It's in, in Switzerland, it's an IT service provider company, and um, I'm talking about stream processing concept and frameworks today. What is the agenda? I will start with the motivation for stream processing. I'm doing that uh, on an architectural level. Then I have capabilities of stream processing or for stream processing. So what is needed for stream processing that will be all vendor neutral. I think that's uh, important if you talk about architecture, about motivation, but also uh, about selection of vendors that you know what it is, what is stream processing, what capabilities uh, could you ask for. And then we're talking about implementing stream processing solutions. And there we have the vendors. Uh, there have a selection of vendors. There's many uh, products out there who can do uh, stream processing. I will concentrate mostly on the Kafka stack because I'm using that quite a lot. I like the Kafka stack. I have some other products in it as well. And if we have time, I have a short demo at the end. But I will more uh, concentrate on the conceptual uh, level on that in that talk because it's an introduction into stream processing. So maybe um, for the audience, show hands who already has done stuff with stream processing. Okay, that's maybe 10%. So I think the audience is quite okay. If you have questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I think it's good if you ask a con if, if you ask a question in the context of the talk. Usually, I don't have enough time at the end, but I'll be around today, so you can also ask me during lunchtime, of course, or after the talk. Um, some words about myself. So I'm working for Trivadis quite a long time. I'm an Oracle uh, Groundbreaker Ambassador. Um, I'm mostly working in the area of uh, yeah, Java. I've done quite a lot. Uh, cloud I'm doing, and in the last couple of years, five, six years, I'm doing big data and fast data stuff. Um, at the beginning, it was more a hobby, uh, but now I'm doing that 100%. Mostly I'm doing talks like uh, today. I'm also, uh, sorry, also active on social media. I have a, a blog where I regularly, every week, um, just have an article on last week in stream processing. I'm just um, covering here not my own material, but I just have a sort of uh, or a set of links showing what has happened last week in the area of stream processing. So I have 155 editions, I think, if that's correct. Uh, I think that was the last one. So I'm doing it for three years, and I'm, I will continue as, as long as the topic is hot. I've written some books but about topics which are definitely not hot anymore, so I don't mention them. So let's go into the, uh, the topic, motivation for stream processing. As I mentioned, I'm doing it on an architectural level, and architectures, I like um, diagrams. So this is, I couldn't say old days, this is big data as, it's as, it's as it has started. You could also say, or you could also put a um, data warehouse in there into the picture, it's, it's more or less the same story. But in big data, what we do is, or what we have done when it has started with Hadoop, we just imported files, big data, we've imported big data, we stored it as raw storage, we had some MapReduce or even Spark to process it, and then we have results, and on the right side you can see consumers of these results. The problem with that is, of course, it's batch processing, it's high latency. You, I mean, you, when you get the files on the source, they're already old. When you load it into Hadoop, they get older. When you do MapReduce, Spark, they even get older. And, and, and so you don't really have uh, up-to-date results or up-to-date data. Then we got streams. Streams as sources. We got maybe social media, we got IoT devices, and they deliver a stream of data, so-called events or you can call it events, you can also call it message, it doesn't matter. It's just very small data you get, but you get a lot of small data. If a device sends you a message every second and you have thousands of devices, you basically get thousands of messages per second. Or if you do Twitter data, you might get thousands of tweets per second, depending on what stream you get. And you have a problem, that's why this arrow goes into the uh, dark. Um, you can't really store that in in uh, in, um, in in big data, you can't really store that in in HDFS because if you store an event or if you store a file per event, these files are just too small. 
So what, ha what have we done? We have added a buffer, so-called event top, or you could also, if I wouldn't, if I would talk about vendors, I could say this is Kafka at the moment, because Kafka is kind of the standard for an event top. It's basically just a buffer, so you buffer your events, uh, and then you have that arrow here, that arrow might run every 30 minutes. So this is batch, so every 30 minutes you get all the events which have been buffered, and by that you get quite a lot of data, and this quite a lot of data then fits quite well with an HDFS file. But of course, you still we're still talking about high latency, not from here to here. Here we are low latency because we get every event. We could do something with every event. Kafka or an event hub supports that. But by running that arrow every 30 minutes, we basically slow down everything. But it, it was fine for quite a long time. It's fine for quite a lot of use cases. If your interest is just storing the raw events so we're able to do some machine learning on it, then of course this architecture is still fine. With machine learning, it doesn't really matter how fast you can create your model. Or, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter. Of course you like it as quick as possible, but you don't like it in milliseconds or seconds. Uh, you're fine with hours or maybe minutes to run. So if you, if you have a use case where you want to be faster than minute or hour, so we're going to seconds or below seconds, you basically have to change the model uh, how you have worked maybe the last 30 years. Or I, I'm in IT for 30 years and I'm just used to that model here. Um, we're getting data, we're storing it, we persist it in a database, in a file system, doesn't really matter, it's always the same story. And if it is persisted, we have some analytics which we run on that data and we get some result. And here we have the problem that is basically asynchronous. There's one guy who stores the information and there's another one who does the analytics on it. And you have to think, how do I find out that I have new data? I mean, you can poll regularly, but polling has some problems. You can't poll every millisecond. It doesn't really matter. Otherwi it doesn't really make sense. Otherwise, your machine is just doing the polling and nothing else. So maybe you poll every five minutes or you poll every minute, but that's basically how far you can get. And that's also basically the speed uh, you get, or the latency you get, the lowest latency. And if you do big, big data, you, you might know that uh, it's not really feasible to run a big a batch job every 30 seconds, because just starting a batch job takes 30 seconds, and then he hasn't done any work yet. So polling intervals, they might be in minutes or even in hours in a big data uh, system. So you have to turn it. What can you do? That's basically event uh, processing. You get a stream of data, and instead of persisting it, you directly do some analytics on it. So you don't persist it at all. You directly analyze it, and then you can store maybe results. So what you want to do is you get millions of events, and not for every event you want to do something. That's usually in, in stream processing. Uh, you, you get a lot of events, and a lot of use cases are or, or one use case is some kind of anomaly detection. So you try to, to find out anom anomalies. And of course, not every event should be an anom anomaly. Otherwise, you have probably a, a bit of a problem with your business. So you maybe have out of 1,000 uh, events, there is one. Or out of 1 million events, there is exactly one you want to find. But you have to find that one event. So here, we would do the analytics, and we would just basically, the simplest uh, version is just filtering out, filtering out everything which is normal, and, and just passing the ones which are abnormal, and doing something with it, either store it for an audit, but mostly what you want to do is you want to act on it immediately, because that's what is the, wh why do you want to have milliseconds or seconds uh, latency, so low latency? in order to stop something. Maybe the anomaly says, tells you the machine will fail or the robot will fail or will kill somebody. So we have to stop it immediately. And so an action here, over here, an action in the old model is mostly uh, a human or often a human who's doing an action. He's just getting a report and he decides that he has to do something. Here, the action is most of the time automatic. So you just maybe um, start a service or execute the service, which then stops your machine. You might also want to visualize it, visualize it uh, in, a, in a way that if a machine is stopped, you might also want to have a visualization which is also low latency. So the visualization should not be a minute behind because now the machine stops and you don't know in the visualization on the dashboard, why has it stopped? So maybe somebody human would like to check why suddenly the machine is stopped. So this is 
stream processing or data in motion. That's the idea. So now in the architecture, what can we do? Or how does it uh, uh, look like? We have the event top. So in event top, we're still low latency. And in event top allows you, of course, Kafka allows you to, to mention that vendor again or that, that product allows you to get the events when they arrive without a lot of latency. I mean, there is some latency involved due to the event hub, but it's very mi minimal. And with stream analytics now, what you can do if you add a platform, a stream analytics platform, you can basically just run analytics on each single event. And you might want to, uh, if you find out an, an anomaly, you might want to also send an event back to the event hub. So somebody else can then take take that event and do something based on that event. And now based on that, we're low latency or lowest latency. Of course, we add some latency by adding event top, by adding stream analytics, but that can be uh, below second. So you don't lose a lot of time here. And the action could then be in an enterprise application. So an existing application you already have today could be the one who's doing the action, but you uh, just add that processing uh, in into the picture in, in between. So that you find out uh, in a in an easy way or, or in a way in a fast way um, what you have to do on your existing system systems. If we are only doing that, we don't have any history because these systems here they want to do low latency, so they can't afford to store every event into a data storage. That will slow you down because then you're at data at rest again. So if you want to keep the history, you can just take it, take what we have seen at the, the, the beginning. We can take the big data platform, Hadoop, or, or, or S3, an object store, would also fit here. And the event top is publish, subscribe. So publish, subscribe means one is doing a publish. This is the source, which is publishing the event. But you have many subscribers. One subscriber is the stream processing or many stream processing, and another subscriber is just the one who stores the raw data into HDFS or S3. And then you have all the raw data here, and you can use that for machine learning, for example, or for, for analytics where you need history. And machine learning nowadays needs history, or machine learning always needs history to produce the models. And that's uh, a combination you can then do, is you process models up here, so you get your machine learning models and you use these models down here in order to decide is it an anomaly or not. So you learn the behavior on historical data and then you use that behavior or that model to actually see if the behavior is an anomaly, anomaly. If it is a fraud, for example, if you're doing fraud detection. And fraud detection is a typical use case of such a stream processing um, infrastructure because if, if you want to prevent fraud, you have to act immediately on every transaction which happens. Now here we have an additional uh, arrow. Why that arrow? In stream processing or with streaming sources, especially in IoT, you often get limited data. So maybe I will show you in the demo, if I have time, a truck uh, demo. So let's say we have trucks driving around and, and they send you location and driving behavior, let's say every second. And to minimize the, the message size, of course, you only send minimal information. So you might send the truck ID, the position, and some behavior of the driver, and maybe the driver ID as well. But of course, you don't send all the, the, the information about the driver, all the information about the truck. What, has it, has he load, uh, what is the, the load of the truck? What, are, what, what is he transporting? This all sits in traditional systems. These are systems you already have, maybe SAP, maybe something else, where you store the driver information, where you store the truck information. And now you get only limited data here. Uh, you store it in the event top. So far, it's fine. But if you want to do some stream analytics here, you might need information about what has this truck loaded or who is the driver. And you want to have that information up to date. So if something changes here, or if you get, let's say that the truck is loaded and he starts driving around. So as soon as you get the, the load in that database here, you have to make sure that you get it as fast as possible into the stream solution. And that's why we have that arrow here. So one, 
strategy or the most uh, the, the the strategy we use today is you're just doing some kind of change data capture here and you're getting all the data into an event hub topic as well and now you can consume two topics one is the stream of events and one is the change events of truck uh, of, of 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 the truck load or a change event of the drivers Another example would be you hire a new driver and he starts driving around. If you don't know about the driver, that might be an anom anomaly because you don't want trucks driving around where you don't know the driver. So you have to make sure that a new driver is added uh, over uh, this arrow to the topic. So you have it here uh, and you can basically join these two streams. And we'll see that just in a minute. Just quickly uh, to the rest uh, in order to uh, be on time. You can also add microservices to here, or uh, or or, or t uh, say it a bit uh, differently. Microservices or stream processing is just one form of microservices. Microservices is more an organizational way of organizing your services. So how big should your services be? Separation of concerns. And this is also what you want to do in stream analytics. And you could say stream analytics is just an implementation form of a microservice. And the, the way you structure your stream analytics blocks or modules is similar to microservices. And microservices, they can also use event hub, so it they can consume stuff from, from uh, event hub and they can produce stuff back to the event hub events, basically. And more and more, we will also get edge nodes in the picture. If you have a uh, if you have a data streams or many data streams, IoT devices, and they send you a lot of information, you might not have have the network capacity to send all this information down into the data center where your stream analytics is, or even into the cloud. That just costs you too much money. So you will add some edge processing, and the edge processing could do the same thing which you do here. Maybe this is just a basic filtering which you do before you send the stuff to the event hub in the in the center. So here you see. There's also some stream processing capabilities which you can add. There's some kind of event top, but they're much smaller on the edge node than there are over here in the data center. And basically, this is just the unified architecture. Now what you can see here, everything moved together in the center. That means you can have one infrastructure where everything runs on, on it, on top of it. This could be container-based, this could be Kubernetes, where you have everything running on Kubernetes. So now if we talk about stream processing and about the concepts, uh, there are two different kind of ways of doing stream processing. So stream processing is the overall topic, and Gartner defined two terms, stream data integration and stream analytics. Stream data integration is the red part. You can't really see it here, but this is all, all the arrows are basically stream data integration, and the green part, stream analytics, is this guy here. So this is where you do the analytics, but the question is, how do you get the events to that stream analytics product? And that's why you have these two terms. Stream data integration is the way to integrate a stream of events with stream analytics. And I like these two terms because um, if we later talk about products, you can clearly map products to either stream data integration or stream analytics. And that makes it easier when you do an evaluation because you have to think about do I need stream integration or do I need stream analytics? And if you have like, yeah, the products already organized in these two uh, kind of terms, then uh, it makes it easier. <coughs> so here we have a first kind of uh, view of products, which we will see later again. So event top nowadays is Kafka. There's also Pulsar, but Kafka is kind of the, the standard. You can get it in the cloud as well. For stream data integration, we have Kafka Connect. I will talk about that stream sets uh, uh, later. And for stream processing, there's uh, for stream analytics, sorry, there's quite a lot. There's Kafka Streams, KSQL. There was a talk this morning around, uh, about it already. Uh, you have Spark Streaming, which I cover. You have Flink uh, and, and, and many others. So this here is open source, and this here are the closed sourced uh, products, they are much older, They're, they are from the days of complex event processing. 
So complex event processing is quite an old uh, topic, and there were many ma vendors which had products over here for complex event processing. You can still use them for stream analytics. Um, the differentiation between these here and these here is open source, closed source, but it's also a difference in the way they scale. So over here, they mostly scale, scale up. So you have add to add more boxes to it, and usually have one box where it runs on. And here we have to scale out. This is also an, a difference. So this is, you could say, this is more modern infrastructure, and this here is a bit more traditional or legacy-based infrastructures. <coughs> So now we come to the capabilities of stream processing, and I have a table here. You don't have to read it, you get it in the PowerPoint, and these are the capabilities I would like to go through. And here you can see stream data integration and stream analytics. So you can see based on the capabilities, some are more used or implemented by products in the stream data integration field, and others are clearly needed or should be uh, available in stream analytics. And there's some overlap, but there are some clear capabilities down here which only exist in stream analytics. <coughs> so that's why these two terms definitely make sense, because you can separate it also by capabilities. I start with some simple capabilities. So of course, you want to be able to integrate data sources. So data sources could be, of course, a native stream. That's the most normal uh, way of integrating when we talk about stream uh, data integration or stream processing. But you can also integrate uh, databases, either by doing change data capture. Change data capture, you get changes directly on the database, so every insert, update, delete is a change. And then you have low latency kind of getting the changes. But of course, you can also do SQL polling. You can poll a database for changes based on a timestamp or latest AID. And a similar thing you have on files. You can either poll for new files and get them as events. And if you do it uh, regularly enough, then you might thi say this is kind of a stream you get from a file. Or if it's a log file, you can just basically tail it. And by tailing it, you get all the new entries into a log file and you can make it into a stream. That's the way you would integrate files. Of course, that you don't really want to do. You only do it if there's this the only way to do it. If you have a native stream, of course, you will always integrate it directly as a stream. This is an IoT stream would be like that, or um, a uh, social media stream such as Twitter would be exactly that over here. And then in stream data integration, you have the capability to do some ETL. ETL, you know from the batch days, from data warehousing, where you do it in batch. The same concept you can also apply for streaming data but you don't have bulk of data which you ETL or which you transform, and there is not really an extract in that way. You basically get the stream, you transform it, and the load means you send it to an event hub, for example. And here you can use kind of the concept of uh, yeah, traditional as well. There's this integration pattern book uh, with lots of patterns, and this could be more or less, or this could be uh, what you do in streaming ETL. And streaming ETL belongs to stream data integration, not to stream analytics. So if you have these two concepts, integration and analytics, you would like to do the transformation first and then get transformed data, normalized data into the analytics where it's yeah, normalized and you don't have to do a lot of work about transformation. You can concentrate on the analytics part, which is complex enough. Then we have two execution mode. One is native streaming. That's kind of the, 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 the mode you would think of. Everything is implemented like that. Native streaming means you get an event, uh, an individual event, and you do some processing directly on that event, and you get some output. And you get the next event, maybe even in parallel, you do the processing, get an output, and so on. And this is an animated slide. I thought about removing the animations, but now we're through. So every event would be processed individually. That is the idea of native streaming. And of course, that is the lowest latency because you only have one event, you have to process it, you get a new event, and that is, of course, quick. There's another mode. Some stream processing solution implement only that. It's called micro-batching. And micro-batching is just an idea of taking a batch engine but making the batch window as small as possible. So you have 
a batch window maybe with only one event, then you're almost similar to native streaming, but it could be a batch window where you have two events. And the batch windows are always the same size, and you basically just wait for the batch window to close. So if you say, my batch window is one second, you wait one second for all events which arrive in that second. It could be one, it could be a thousand, and then you process all, them, all of them in that window together, and you also produce a result with all the results for all the events together. And by that, you add, of course, latency, because you have to wait one second until you can process or start processing. The processing might also take a second, so you have two seconds latency. It's still much better than the old days of batch processing where we talked about hours, but um, it might not be good enough for, use for your use case. If your use case says you have to be below a second, it's almost impossible to reach it with that. And Spark Streaming nowadays still has that micro-batching model. And that's very important. You don't have to start your use case if you know you have to be below seconds. There's no way to start it with Spark Streaming uh, because you know from the beginning that it will not work. I'm not saying that Spark Streaming is not good, but this is what they have in it, this kind of micro-batch batching model. And of course it continues, and this is the same animation, but you just have to click a few times. And you can see each batch window, of course, is different in size because it just matters or it's just, it just dependent on how much data you get per time interval. Then we have delivery guarantees. Delivery guarantees are at most once, at least once, and exactly once. What you would like to have is definitely exactly once. Exactly once means every event is processed exactly once. Once, not twice, not zero times, once. But this is difficult to get or achieve the most the easiest one to get is at least once. And at least once means you get it once, but you could also get it twice, three times, because there is some retransmission involved. If you have, if you don't really know if it worked, and we don't have transactions, that's important in stream processing. There's no concept of transaction or XA transactions. Um, and so uh, if we don't know if it has worked, we just retry. So in some cases, there's some timeouts involved. If we reach a timeout, we will retry. We will send the message again, and then we produce it a second time. And maybe it has worked, but we didn't know about it. This, is, this doesn't have to be the end of the world. You can either do um, some duplicate detection later in stream processing as well, or if you store it in a database, let's say, you just do a merge, and then you might have removed your duplicates. So. That's not the end of the world. This here, at most once, is zero or once. So that you probably only want to do if you, if you don't care, if you lose some messages. And of course, the idea is not that this happens all the time. These are, again, anomalies. This should only happen from time to time. But it's important to know if it happens from time to time, then you get duplicates here, or you might lose some information from time to time. And depending on your use case, this is a problem or it's not a problem. Then API is basically the idea to say, how do we work as a developer? Or maybe you don't even have to be a developer. So if you have a GUI-based drag and drop interface, you might not have to be really a developer. You can just drag and drop some, uh, uh, some, 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 some operations to it and basically define a flow in a graphical way. So some tools are in this area. Some tools are declarative, so you just get a JSON kind of dialect or language where you define what, ha what should be done or what the tool should do. And this is all you have to do. This is all you have to provide. And behind the scene, you have some connectors um, which then do the work. So basically, this is kind of the input to the constructor of the connector. The con connector is constructed with this input and then starts running. Then you have some program programmatic APIs, or some products are in the programmatic way where you have an either a low level where you're in class based or a high level fluent API similar to this this one here. So you just program in a fluent API way what the product should do or you define with a fluent API what it should do. Now in this case here it's just I'm doing a filtering, a where clause on a stream uh, and event type has not to be normal or if it's not normal then I want to pass it on. So this is our this is an anomaly I want to detect. And kind of the latest way of doing it is by using some kind of SQL dialect. So instead of selecting from a table with streaming SQL, you select from a stream. And the stream, of course, 
has to have some structure or structure. So if you think about, if you know about Kafka or Event Tops, they don't know about the structure, so you have to help SQL defining a structure here. And if you define the structure, you can then access that structure. So the structure tells you there's an event type somewhere in the stream, and you can select on that event type by using the language you might already know. And if you already know SQL from relational database, then of course that helps. I mean, then streaming SQL is definitely interesting because you can use or reuse your know-how and use it now on streaming as well. Then we have the concept of time. And that's quite important. And at the beginning, not all of the tools were able to distinguish between different times. So the easiest way for a tool is just to use the processing time because that's what the tool has. And the event is here. It's, uh, I don't know, 12, uh, 40, so I'm processing it as 12.40. But if you do it this way, then you don't know what's ha what has happened to the event on the way, basically inside the stream data integration. What has happened to that event? Maybe it has, it has been slowed down because the network was slow or the network was not there. If you have like a mobile application and somebody just enters something, this is the event time, and he has no connection that event will wait on the mobile until I have connection again. Okay, we have connection there almost everywhere, but in Switzerland we have some mountains where you definitely have no connections if you're up there. And then the question is, is this the business event time which is important or is it good enough to have processing time? If this the business event is important, you wanna maybe count and we'll see that you can count. And count has always a window, a window of time. And now the question is, which time do I use? Do I use the event time or do I use the processing time? If you want to use the event time, then the tool has to know about it and there needs to be a way how you transport the event time from the mobile device all the way down to the stream analytics solution. And of course, stream analytics solution cannot do any matching. You also have to implement it in the mobile application to transport the event, but you need to have a way to map in the stream processing solution to that event time. So event time is the this guy here. So in this case, everything is normal. And in this case, that would be, no, sorry, the green one would be, I'm on the mountains, I have no connection. And a little bit later, I have connection and the event is sent. It's ingested, that's another way or another time. And ingestion means it's it, it has arrived on the event top and then I, processing, I process it later because the, 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 the processing is under heavy load, then you might also have some lag between ingestion and processing. And because we have a stream of data, and if we want to do something on that stream of data, we have to think about windows. Why? Because the stream of data never ends. And that's very, uh, uh, that's different to a table. A table has a certain set of 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 rows, and if you do a do an, an count, you basically do a, a full table scan of your table, and this is what the counts deliver. If you would do a count and you wouldn't have windows, then the count would never end because there's still new events coming in, and the count has to say, "I have to wait, I have to wait, I have to wait," and you never get a result, which is not very funny. So what do you do? You define a window of data. You basically say, "I want to have a window of one minute." And now you have that one minute window and all the events within that window are treated for your count or are taken for your count or for other operations as well. And if you want to do some counting or uh, if you want to do some operation, there are different ways uh, of or different window styles. There are fixed window styles where you just have like, let's say one minute and then you move it exactly by another minute, other minute, other minute. And all the events are in one window. You can have sliding windows, could also be of size one minute, but you have a slide of maybe 10 seconds in that uh, uh, diagram here. So you slide it by 10 seconds, so some events are in two windows in that case. And you can have session windows. Session windows is if you want to tr uh, track user behavior, you would group by, in that case, by color, or color could just be uh, the customer, so you group by customer and you want to find out what a certain customer does or what color blue does or green in that case is the better example and 
And you also don't know when does your behavior or when does the customer stop. So if you want to treat or track behavior on a website, you have lots of events on the website, but you basically don't know when the customer will leave. So what you do is you have a timeout and you just define if there's a timeout or if, if, it, if, it's, if it's longer than, let's say, 30 seconds, you stop the tracking of green and this is your window. And if you get a new green, that will be a new window or a new session which you track. And of course, you would, you, you would like to avoid these kind of interruption and having two sessions. But of course, you also want to do some, some analytics. So you have to define how long do I wait until I say the context is closed because probably the customer has left and now I can do the analytics. So this is our, this, uh, this is, this, these are session windows. And these are all capabilities you can find in stream processing solutions. So, so that's not now kind of uh, a an, an task you have to do as a programmer and implement it on your own. That's, if you need that, you should be able to find it in the solution which you have chosen for stream analytics or stream processing. Then you can do joins. Joins means I have two streams and I want to join them together. And here you have the same problem in a way. The streams are never ending. They provide you event time and you have to find the two matching events. And of course they never arrive at the same second, uh, after at the same millisecond. This is just not possible. So if you have uh, 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 like a, a, a stream from, from a truck or two streams from a truck. The, uh, the one is the, the, the position and the other one is the driver behavior and you want to join them together. They will never arrive at the same millisecond. So you also need some window in order to do the joins. But there is a much simpler join. That's a stream to static join. Often you need that. This is exactly the, I have some driver behavior. So I have the truck sending me position and behavior of the driver. And I want to know who is the driver. So I have one truck where the driver is the green one, and I get some information about the green one, and I want to join it with the data I know about the driver. So this is the static data which I get from change data capture. So this static data is almost never changing, so it's kind of a cache you have, and you just join that to the stream. And that's much simpler because this is here. Here you get the new events, and here you just have the the driver data cached and you just have to find the, the match. And here you could say if I don't have a match, in similar to an outer join, or it's, ac it's actually an outer join, if I have a green, or let's say I have a, I think there's one sample, the blue one, no, we have a blue one as well, so here it, it matches. So let's say we get a purple uh, driver and we don't have the purple driver down here, we wouldn't be able to join, so it's an outer join, and we get null as driver, and that could be the anomaly. We could say now we have a driver which we don't know and this might be wrong. And then we have the stream to stream joins. And they are more difficult, but frameworks can offer them to you, so you don't have to implement anything. But here you just have to think about window again. Because as I said, these two streams, I would like to join the green with the green, the red with the red, the yellow with the yellow, but they don't arrive at the same time, exactly the same millisecond. So you have to wait a bit. And if you know that this guy here is always arriving before this one here, then you can have a window only on that one. If you don't know that, you have to do a window on both. So you just have some state where you keep the data, and then you can always try to find a match. This is how joining works in stream processing. And you need windows. And windows, in general, they hold state, of course. You have events in state, and the state management is, of course, quite important. Because if you want to scale out, you also want to be able to scale out the, the state. And the worst thing would be that all the window, the, the, the data of a window has to keep kept on all the all the nodes, then you can't really scale out. So you want to kind of uh, partition your state as well. And stream processing frameworks or tools, they can do that. They can either do it in memory, then the question is what happens if I lose one node, then the state is gone. Might not be very good if you have a state of one hour. You lose that state, your application is basically worthless for another hour because you have to up kind of get to that state again. Um, 
there is an embedded state store, or there could be a replicated distributed state store, some kind of NoSQL. That's uh, options you have. And of course, the more the memory is more uh, is, is kind of closer to your stream processing, so it might be easier. And the NoSQL database is a separate beast, a separate uh, infrastructure you have to maintain, so much more difficult. But all could work. If you have state, you can also think about offering that state, not just to your stream processing, but to the outside world. Why would you like to do that? Maybe you want to have a dashboard. You have some state about trends. So in Twitter, you just count hashtags, and you know how many hashtags Trump you got, and you count them, and what has been said about him. And now you would like to offer a dashboard where you can just show these numbers. And often, what, you have, what we have done in the past is we just stored that information into an OSQL database or into a rational database, and you had a dashboard just uh, using that database. But if you can query the state directly, which is available in the stream analytics from outside, you don't need that extra store. And the dashboards can just visualize the state. That's the idea of queryable state or interactive queries. Also, that is available as a capability in some of the tools. And the last one, and then I have a problem with the vendors. I will just briefly go over uh, the vendors. And for the demo, we definitely don't have time. Um, the last capability is event pattern detection. And this is not regular expression. This is not detecting text or regular expression in a text. This is a pattern over multiple events. For example, if you want to track the stock market and you want to find out is a stock a stock ticker, is it increasing or decreasing? Um, you can't just take one event and say it's increasing. You can't also just take two events and say it's increasing because it could go up a little bit and then go down much more. Go up a little bit, go down. This is a downward trend. So in order to detect that, you have to be able to detect, to have multiple events. This is again a, a window. And now you want to detect a pattern in that window. So this could be decreasing pattern, it could be an absence pattern, which is also interesting. You have one event, and you think that another event, or you know another event should happen, but it never happens. This could be a pattern, and if you have pattern detection, you can easily use that to detect exactly these patterns. This is also something which could be there out of the box. So we're through the capabilities, and we're also almost through, through the uh, presentation in terms of time. So I will just uh, use the last two or three minutes I have, two minutes, um, to quickly mention the tools. It's really a, a quick go over. We have already seen it. We have Kafka. I think, or I assume that most of you know Kafka. It's just a buffer, a highly scalable buffer. So uh, you could say it's just a topic, as you might know from JMS, but it's just much more scalable. Um, and yeah, so this is your buffer. And then based on this buffer, if you're in the Kafka world, you can use Kafka Connect to do the stream data integration. So Kafka Connect is only stream data integration. It's only, only in, in, in parentheses, it's only getting sources into Kafka or getting from Kafka data out to the outside world. This is what Kafka Connect can do. You have multiple connectors for all sorts of systems. So it's very easy, you get a connector and you basically just configure it in a declarative way. This is Kafka Connect. You can get a similar thing from stream sets and others as well. You can use NIFI, you can use Spring uh, Cloud Dataflow, I think it is called. The same thing, it's data integration mostly. And here with stream sets, you have a nice visual way of drawing what you want to do. And it just depends what you want to do. This could be better if you want to do a lot in your stream. This here is a bit better because you can't do a lot in it. All you do is basically integrate. So here, a programmer or somebody doing this visual stuff could do much more than you as an architect might want. So simplicity is sometimes also good because you know nothing can go wrong because there's, no, there's not a lot of things you can do. And if you can't do a lot of things, you can also not do it really wrong. Then for stream analytics in the Kafka world, you have either Kafka Streams or you have KSQL. Kafka Streams is programmatic. 
Java or I think there's a Scala API nowadays as well. There's a Python implementation, but not from Kafka, um, but similar to, to Kafka streams. So you have to be a programmer. I think it's a very good solution because it's just a Java library and you can integrate it everywhere you ha where you have Java, which is quite interesting because other stream processing solutions, they often provide you your own infrastructure or their own infrastructure, which you have to run as well. And if you already run Java, you can just add stream processing capabilities to your Java application. Quite interesting. And all the capabilities we have seen are implemented here for stream analytics, except of the pattern detection. That's not there yet. One minute over, so let me skip to KSQL, or KSQL is just a SQL language on top of Kafka Streams. So everything you have from Kafka Streams is there as well, but now you don't use Java, you use SQL in order to do or to tell stream processing or stream analytics what you want to do. Interesting if you know SQL. If you don't know SQL, maybe not so interesting, but who doesn't know SQL nowadays? Maybe in 10 years it's different, I don't know. And last but not least, Spark structured streaming. Interesting if you already do Spark from Hadoop, from, back, uh, from Big Data, because you can use the same language, but still only micro batch at the moment. There is a native streaming on the way. They want to add it because it's important, but uh, for production readiness, it's still only micro batching. So you have some latency involved. This is how you use it. If you know data frames from Spark, there's just the Spark structured streaming, which uses data frames as well. And data frames you can program with Java, with Scala, with Python, with R, and there's also SQL support in it. Not as good in my point of view as KSQL, but there is some SQL in it as well. Good, the demo we skip, unfortunately, and we have the summary. So stream processing provides you low latency. This is the only way to get low latency if you have a stream of data. There is the event hub, stream data integration, stream analytics as the building block in an architecture. I think that is important. And now if you know that I need an event hub, you have to choose a product. For stream data integration, you have to choose a product. And for stream analytics, you have to choose a product. Maybe event hub and stream data integration is good enough because there's no analytics involved. You just want to have high late, uh, low latency uh, between stream and maybe an OSQL database. But as soon as you need the stream analytics capabilities, such as window, joining, uh, pattern detection, stream analytics is needed. And there are different products, as I showed you, uh, which you can use. I personally like the Kafka stack, but this is not the only way you can use it. Event top nowadays, you basically, if you do it on-prem, Kafka is the solution you have, but Kafka integrates with a lot of other tools in the stream data integration, stream analytics space as well. Good, so that's it. Um, sorry for the three minutes uh, overdue, uh, and if you have questions, I would say I leave you for, for lunch, and I'm here, so if you have questions, just come to the podium, and I hope I can answer them. Thanks, and um, <laughs> good <laughs> appetit. <laughs> or bon, bon appétit of, in French, which I can't speak.